The Immaculate Slays Heresies by St. Maximilian Kolbe You alone have destroyed all the heresies in the whole world. How can this be? For indeed heresies yet exist. Here, Holy Church, in its prayers to the Most, Mother, Most Holy Mother of God, speaks of the already accomplished destruction of heresies. All of them. When in one of his battles, Napoleon was brought the news of the enemy arriving on one flank, he retorted, The enemy is defeated. Indeed, the battle was not yet ended, nor was victory at all evident. But this clever leader knew that once his cavalry entered the fray, there was no hope of victory for his opponents. And similarly, we too often hear, That one is finished. This one is lost. That one has no chance. Although the affair has not yet ended, the situation is already hopeless. So the church likewise proclaims concerning our most holy mother, you have destroyed all the heresies in the whole world from the office of the Blessed Virgin Mary. What beautiful words. Note it is a question of heresies. She does not destroy heretics. These she loves. She wants their conversion. It is her love toward them that prompts her to free them from heresy by destroying in them erroneous attitudes and convictions. Note too the word destroyed. The heresies are not only lessened and weakened, but removed entirely, destroyed, so that there will not remain any trace of them. What heresies? All. All, without exception. And where? In the whole world. Heresy is to be destroyed not only in one or another country or on part of the earth, but in all countries in the whole world. And she herself will have destroyed them. Therefore, nothing else is necessary, because she has been empowered to do this herself. With joy, then, let us recall to ourselves these powerful words. You have destroyed all the heresies in the whole world. How does she do this? Mysterious are the marvelous ways of God's providence and its activity in souls through the Immaculate. She enters the soul either through interior aspirations or through some circumstance. And when she enters a soul, or if the doors of the soul open but a little, she comes to it to purify it of sins and vices, embellishes it with virtues, and leads it to a fervent love. We love our late neighbors, those close to us, but do we have a place in our heart for the poor souls caught in the snares of heresy, or unbelief, or schism? Let us open our hearts to these, and let us bring the Immaculate to their poor hearts, that she might bring true happiness, God, to them. Let us strive to awaken them, that they might do something for the Immaculate, even if only to subscribe to our Knight of the Immaculate, or to send some offering to the Immaculate, or in some other way to do something for her. She will not forget this, and we ourselves will have gained merit before God. Sometimes I read and hear the words of those who are surprised that we Catholics honor Mary, the mother of Jesus. Again, I received a letter to this effect on January 16th of this year, expressing surprise that Catholics honor Mary as God. Assuredly, the author of this letter did not know that the Catholic Church does not honor any of the saints as God, but only as the faithful servants and friends of God. Mary we honor as the mother of God, and this not as if she gave divinity to Jesus, but for the following reason. Although she gave him his human body from her own flesh, nevertheless it was God who became incarnate in her womb and who truly lived in her. She gave birth to the God-man. Difficulties with respect to the veneration of Mary most often recur among Protestants, but there is already an awakening among some of them. There is now a much greater yearning for the mother of supernatural life of the soul. Let us, brief, let us listen briefly to such voices in different lands. In Germany, for example, in 1919, the Protestant writer Mr. Jung Nichols stated, The evangelical church is dying from spiritual coldness. We must bring it to the mother, to Mary. Then it will all warm up. Similar statements are often found in the Protestant publication Die Hochkirche. The Protestant pastor, J. Lortzings from Getting, issued a few years ago a book under the title Marian Flowers on Foreign Soil, in which he had collected over a hundred different testimonies following the cult of Mary. In November of last year, there appeared in Cologne an appeal to all evangelical Christians, which asked for the beginning of a return to Marian devotion in the Protestant churches. The author reminded readers that people honor the mothers of great men, Frau Gottschow, the mother of Goethe, St. Monica, the mother of St. Augustine, St. Helena, the mother of Constantine, and he recalls yet other great women. And at the end of his appeal, he cries out, only one woman is excluded among us, only one remains forgotten, neglected, and that is the Virgin Mary, mother of our Lord and Savior. 
He further reminds us that Luther sang the praises, praises of Mary in many hymns, and that in the 17th century the Protestant bishops of Iceland, Björn Geofil Svensson, composed songs to Mary in Latin. In England, at the entrance of the Protestant church in Walsingham, there is this writing which the Anglican bishop Bertram placed on the occasion of the church's rededication. This sanctuary, erected in 1061 at the request of the Holy Virgin, Mother of God, in honor of the Incarnation, during the reign of St. Edward, confessor and king for 19 years afterwards, and then destroyed completely by the king, Henry VIII, who was obsessed by the most horrible love, may God have mercy on his soul, was restored for the first time in this year, 1931. In Holland, the Protestant writer Kor Marinsky issued a stirring flyer entitled A Petition to Mary, where, among many other things, he writes, We do not yet have songs to Mary, or shrines to Mary, or even pictures of Mary. Mary among us is an insignificant, obscure figure who is noted only once a year, Christmas. We Protestants remain overly concerned with the Old Testament. Meanwhile, no one can come near to Christ unless he receives him from the hands of Mary. What a strong longing for their spiritual mother these testimonies represent. And how right these yearnings are. If, indeed, everywhere that life begins and forms, the loving heart of a mother watches over it, why should the life of faith, supernatural life, the life of grace, which is the very life of God, be exempt from the warmth of a maternal heart? Why should we not receive God's own divine life through the spiritual mother he has lovingly provided us?